to the latest installment of my dad listens to this. I'm Juliet the daughter. I'm still Kevin the dad. And this week we are back with part two of our coverage of Bob Newhart. So dad, uh, what should we remind our audience members of before we dive into it? Uh, well, first it's the two disc anthology, something like this, the Bob Newhart collection, the anthology, one of them. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. You think I would have written it down? <laughs> anyway, in part one, we covered Bob's albums from 1960 to 1961. Mm-hmm. He put out three albums in about a year, Not which bad. is pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, now, part two this week covers the period of 1962 to 1967, a period in which he put out four albums. So I get three albums in one year. Now you've got four albums out in five years because he yeah. was he was getting busier, doing a lot more TV mm-hmm. and uh, dipping a toe into the movie waters, yep. as it were, mm-hmm. and doing the touring. I saw um, when I was in Salem yesterday. I saw a laser disc copy of one of his movies because they were selling a bunch of laser discs. Laser discs. Yeah, it was that movie he did with Kevin Klein, In and Out. Oh yes. Yeah, I was. That like, was Wow, laser discs. Yeah, they're they selling have a whole the box of them. Laser disc player also for sale? No, just the discs themselves. Huh. Anyway, back to Bob. Okay, got a couple of random Bob tidbits. In part one, we had talked about how Bob did not want to have children on any of his shows because mm-hmm. he was afraid to be like, oh, it's Dopey Dad kind of thing. Yeah. But that changed in 1992 with his show Bob. Yep. He did have a daughter. Of course, she was grown up, yeah, and she was played by the always hilarious Cynthia Stevenson. And, believe it or not, he was Don Rickles' best friend. Really? The two of them? Yep. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but he was his best friend, and as Bob once said, someone had to do it. <laughs> That's a hell of a way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> so, let's dive into our Second next disc. Coverage. All right. Thank you. All right, first track on disc two, Introducing Tobacco to Civilization. Bob Newhart gets to thinking about discoveries, particularly the discovery of tobacco, and how its uses might not be obvious to everybody. So he imagines a phone conversation between Walter Raleigh and the West Indies Company. Needless to say, they're not too impressed with him buying 80 tons of leaves. Raleigh tries to explain how it can be snuffed, chewed, and smoked, and the West Indies Company is just rolling on the floor laughing at another of Crazy Walt's ideas. Such is the way when people try new things, you get mocked until it becomes the latest fad with the people who ridiculed it in the first place. But I think the sketch would be great to play for people trying to get uh, trying to get people to stop smoking once you break down how stupid it really is. What, you just take leaves and you light them on fire? That's dumb. Once again, Bob makes you think about some of the most mundane things in daily life and how strange they actually are when you break it down. Cinema Therapy did a good talk about that, about how um, some plots of movies are really ridiculous when you break them down. Like, so you're telling me you got bitten by a radioactive spider and that's you got all these powers? That's so stupid! Well, I remember The Onion did this, did this article... Um in their book, Our Dumb Century, mm-hmm. about, uh, and the headline was, Teenage Boy Dies from Radioactive Spider Bite. Yeah. And this was also, um, you know, they had instances before where Dr. Bruce Banner died from being exposed to gamma radiation. Yeah. And how Reed, Sue, Johnny, and Ben all died from being exposed to cosmic rays in outer space. Yeah. Anyway. It was just one death after another. Yep. Anyway, so this and the next three skits are from 1962's The Button Down Mine on TV. And this was after he had his one season Bob Newhart show, which won an Emmy and a Peabody Award. And I guess some of the material on this album was based on skits from uh, the TV show. Hmm. And to me, this is sort of reminiscent of the Wright Brothers sketch. But in this case, it's Sir Walter Raleigh trying to yeah. introduce tobacco to his bosses back in England via a phone call. But you just hear his boss's side of the conversation. Yeah. Tobacco. What's tobacco, Walt? It's a kind of leaf. You bought 80 tons of it? <laughs> it's not. Oh, it's not that kind of leaf. Okay. Okay. <laughs> What's snuff? You take a pinch of tobacco and shove it up your nose and it makes you sneeze? I imagine it would, Walt. See, Goldenrod seems to do it pretty good over here, Walt. And my favorite, you stick it between your lips. Then what do you do with it, Walt? You set fire to it. 
There's <laughs> so many great lines in this skit, and it's hilarious, and it's just it's just a classic. And he does bring up a good point where something's introduced, and it might take you know he says about fifty years or so for it to yeah. for people to come around to it after getting over the ridiculousness of it. I mean, because towards the end, you know, there's also the introduction of coffee. It's a type of bean, and you drink it. And most people have that with their cigarette. That's what you call them, cigarettes, huh? The version of, of Walter Raleigh that I was taught in a middle school with Mr. Sal was he gave us, like, the crib note summary. He basically said, so Walter Raleigh was this guy who slept with Queen Elizabeth, and uh, he, he was done, didn't want any more. And so then he goes to the Carolinas, and he comes back to England, and he's like, hey, look, I got all this tobacco and all this indigo, and now we have all this money. And Queen Elizabeth goes, <laughs> hang him. <laughs> and did he get hanged? Uh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Don't spurn the queen. I guess not. The other thing I find interesting, and I think I would do some research on this later, mm -hmm. is that Bob mentions the West Indies Company. Yes. And I wonder if he really meant the East India Company. East India was tea. East India was just... Tea. I thought they were involved in a lot more. Tea have to do some... Well, they were involved in a lot more, but tea is what they're most known for. Yeah, they were involved in a, a lot. lot. They just have like this, you know, drab name, East India Company, but oh man, they were dominant. Yeah, most of the world still <clears throat> can't forgive them for what they did to their country, which understandable. Yeah, yeah. Next track, The Siamese Cat. Bob talks about a delicate subject for pet owners. To neuter or not to neuter a male cat at the age of eight months. This is a pretty rare sketch for Bob because it's very short and it doesn't involve a phone conversation or any conversation at all. But as Bob says, it's pointless to put yourself in the cat's shoes. So how did the cat react to being fixed? Well, as Bob says, he sits on the television all day and gives him the death stare. And once you end that story, uh, it's kind of hard to move on from there. A short bit, but one with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It starts off with Bob doing an imitation of a stoned cat. Stoned in the marijuana sense, yes. Yes. And time. I don't want to give it away. It, I think it's hilarious. You just have to hear him do it. It's hysterical. If you've gone on TikTok and you've seen any videos of cats high on catnip, think that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just love his line. When a cat gets to be, oh, eight months old, you have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is a very short sketch, and this is the shortest one in the whole collection. And it's funny, but it's a little odd hearing Bob talk about suburban situations after what's gone before. Yeah. And he, as as we go along with this, he has more like everyday life yeah. kind of situations um, along with the... Um, the outrageous ones as well. I think it had to do with him being married uh, at this point for a certain number of years. Um, well, he didn't get married till 19... Was it 1963, I think? So, yeah, this was on here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, this came out in 62, so it's a little before. But, yeah, it's 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 possible. Um, but, yeah, he's starting to not move away from the crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. But he's he's definitely... Tempering it, I suppose. Mm, I suppose. Next track, Diffusing the Bomb. Bob said there was a movie on bomb disposal in Germany, and around the same time, a bomb dislodged itself from a plane, so they had to send the experts to disarm it. Which gets him to wondering, what happens when the non-experts come in? Well, Bob gives us a phone call between the police and the non-experts in a coastal city. The opening line is great. You found a shell on the beach? You think that's unusual? What's the matter? It doesn't sound like the ocean when you hold it up to your ear? Once the chief realizes what kind of shell it is, he decides to read the instructions over the phone. And once he learns how long it's been ticking, <laughs> well, they're going to have to move rather fast. Oh, and also the manual has coffee stains on it, obscuring the words. But there's a plot twist with the torpedo that I will not spoil for you. All we can say is, it's now in the hands of the Coast Guard. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I would Wait, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I would find this a lot funnier if police were actually competent, but alas, this feels all too close to reality. For reference, see the episode of the IT crowd where there's a bomb about to go off and Moss gets involved. I rest my case. <laughs> yeah, this is a takeoff on every one of those which wire to cut bomb scenes in movies that are such a cliche. Yep. And like you said, it's there's always experts, but what if it's like the people who have no idea what's going on? <laughs> and yes, they get out the manual. 
And of course, there's a coffee stain covering up the important part. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the, is it you cut the bluish gray wire or you cut the grayish blue one? And as we found out on Sherlock season three, uh, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen it, all bombs have an off switch. Yes. They do. Yes. Um, it's it's laugh out loud funny and it's even suspenseful because mm-hmm. it's like, you know, okay, it's ticking. What are you going to do? Are you going to get this done in time? What's going to happen? And like Juliet said, I, I do not want to give away the ending because it's something that you have to hear for yourself. And this is one of those skits that I played on um, Pandora whilst working at Whole Foods. Oh, what did people say? I would go in at night to use the Mac for my... Um, Adobe Illustrator class that I took at Rhode Island School of Design. Yeah. So they didn't have a problem with that at all. It was off the clock. It was nighttime. No one was using it. Mm-hmm. And so I would put on Bob, and I would just laugh myself stupid. And this was one of the skits. And people would just walk by and say, what are you listening to? And I would try to explain it to them, and they would just back away slowly. <laughs> hey, Whole Foods people, anybody remember that? If so, leave a note in the comments. All right, next track, A Friend with a Dog. Bob posits a scenario most of us are familiar with. You're visiting a friend and discover they now own a big, scary dog. So how do you go about the situation when you want to be polite, but you're also terrified out of your skull? And most importantly, what do you do when you're left with the dog by yourself? Let's just say for Bob, it leads to a chewed-up fountain pen. For me, I don't have this situation with dogs, more so with cats. And not just cats, psycho kittens. A guy I used to hang out with had this feral cat whose favorite pastime was clawing people's legs. Oh. I was always scared of that cat. I think this act is one you need to see live in person because I can tell Bob is employing a lot of physical comedy that we can't see to mimic being near a big dog and be being dragged off by a big dog at the end. But this is one of those times where we can relate to Bob a little too well. Mm, yeah. And once again, meanwhile, back in suburbia. And I think this is a situation that ha- that's happened to almost all of us at least once. You go to a friend's house, they have a big dog, and so they're used to it, so much to the point that they're not aware of how aggressive it can be to others. Like when we go to the New Year's Eve parties and Uncle Jim and Auntie dies and their friends bring their big dogs and Mom is just scared out of her mind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're like big as anything. I mean, they're friendly, but yeah. it's just, you know, they're really large dogs and they're just like galumphing all over the place. Yep. Um, and then the friend leaves the room for a minute. And the dog is just looking at you, and you're looking at the dog, and it's like, (laughs) what are you going to do? Hey, fountain pen, go get the fountain pen, boy. Fetch. Yes. Mm. And, of course, the dog has to be a Doberman. And, Mm -hmm. yeah, I just love the way Bob starts stuff. Hi there, fella. Hi. Hi. (laughs) And the friend comes back in the room, and, you know, Bob finds out more about the dog and, you know, do this and don't do that. And he and the dog can't understand the concept of no more. Mm-hmm. And it's just funny. But, yeah, there are those people who are just like it just kind of goes over their head that not everyone's probably a dog person and that your dog is probably not going to like everyone. At least you didn't try to hump Bob's leg. <laughs> Next track, The Expectant Father. Bob informs the audience that he recently had a baby boy with his wife, and he talks about how men could never have babies because they couldn't stand the pain, making Bob wonder how the world is overpopulated if birth is so horrible. So how did Bob deal with his wife going into labor while she was as cool as could be? Well, let's just say not well. From nicking his face while shaving so bad he needed multiple band-aids to calling the dentist instead of the OBGYN, he's a bit of a nervous wreck. So Bob recounts the events of the day and describes his surroundings at the hospital to us. This might also be the first sketch where I've heard an insurance company reference by name. Because when they were asking for the coverage, they're like, do you have Blue Cross or something else? Oh, yeah. But the happy ending is that he had a son, Robert, 7 pounds, 11 ounces. This would be a great sketch for new and expecting parents to listen to. That way they could find some humor in the labor process. Just to remind you that it is all worth it. Or it should be anyway. Yeah, you were worth it. Thanks. Yep. Even though they, you know, I, I took the classes that you're supposed to go to. And sometimes I was the only guy in the class with your mom and all the other women are looking at me like, my son of a bitch husband, he didn't come, but this guy, this guy came. <laughs> and so did, did all the training, did all who 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 he, 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 only to have you, you know, get stuck, be a cesarean. And they're like, sir, you're going to have to leave the room. Not unless you want to see mom's guts in a metal bowl. I did. I'm like, cool. I looked over like, don't look over. I looked over like, whoa. 
that was just fascinating. Like, wow, yeah. they take all that out and then they can put it all back in. Yep. Like the ultimate jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Anyway, this and the next two skits are from 1963's Bob Newhart faces Bob Newhart faces Bob Newhart. <laughs> now, Bob covers a lot of familiar territory on this skit. Now, at the time, I think this may have been new material, but, you know, this was almost 60 years ago, so we've heard we've heard this a lot about the expected father mm-hmm. and, you know, they're going to be the nervous wreck and the wife is calm as anything. And like you said, you know, you know, I called Dr. So-and-so. That's my dentist. Why would you, why the hell would you call a dentist? Well, I figure they all know each other. You know, he called the other doctor and, you know. <laughs> and um, it's a pleasant enough skit. And when you listen to it, you notice that it doesn't get any roaring laughter from the audience. Mm-hmm. It gets like, you know, polite laughter. And it's not a bad skit at all, but like I said, we've we've been here before. Mm. And if you want another example of this that's really funny, watch the episode of Dick Van Dyke where his wife goes into labor oh, and Rob yes. is just a mess. He tries to go into work and they're like, Rob, go home. He's like, I can't, I can't. But it's funny because you get to see it and he is so physical. Yes, he is. And I think we kind of miss that with just hearing Bob talk about it instead of seeing him going through the motions as he's telling the story as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Next track, on Poodles and Planes. Bob tells us he and his wife have two poodles and they're with him on a flight to Las Vegas. To be honest, the Graysdale Ferguson airline is a better sketch about flying as a passenger. This sketch doesn't really go anywhere and is pretty short, but there isn't a point. So if you want to skip this track, feel free. Yeah, yeah. And I like, I like though... Bob tells us how he has two poodles, Willard and Wilbur, from mm-hmm. the Wright Brothers sketch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, is this Willard? Where's Willard? Uh, I mean, Wilbur. Yeah. <laughs> and this was the first time that that clicked. I thought, oh, I know where he got the names. But he does give some good advice. Never get two dogs, though, because if you go out and come back and they've messed on the floor, you don't know which one did it. Yep. So what do you do? You punish both of them or you try and figure out? Okay, who's got the dirty ass? Mm. Which you probably don't want to do that. No. Anyway, then he, for some reason, he segues into flying on planes, I think because they had to ship the dogs to when they moved. Yeah. And Bob just hates flying on planes, which he established in the Grace L. Ferguson skit, Mm -hmm. and he'll establish in another skit. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was funny, though. Like, he likes the old prop planes because at least you knew the engines were on by the noise. With, you know, the jets now, it's just, and it's like, okay, they could be on. You think they might be on. You can't see any propellers turning. It could be on. But I like the thing, like, you know, they go out and they kick the tires, and then they check out, you know, they've got some guy out there counting how many engines there are. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure that there are four, because maybe someone could have stolen one, and you're only left with three. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It's an okay skit, but I find it to be the weakest in the whole collection. Yeah, I can see that. But it's not its not bad, though. Next track, The Man Who Looked <laughs> Like Hitler. Bob tells the audience that he's shorter than people think, and he gets mistaken for a guy named Fred Neff. He says he's not surprised as there's a theory everyone has a double. But what if you look like someone famous? For example, what if you look like Adolf Hitler? So Bob plays the poor person who sits next to Hitler's doppelganger on a plane, and he's trying to tell anyone who will listen that it's Hitler on the plane and they need to turn it around. And when the doppelganger confesses to Bob that he's aware of this comparison, Bob claims he doesn't see it and rushes off to get a drink. As for me, I think it'd be pretty easy to know that it wasn't Hitler, considering, you know, he killed himself, but Bob was probably panicking too hard to remember. So if you bump into someone who looks like a famous person, always double check. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, so now Bob leaves suburbia, which means he's back on track, skit-wise. Mm-hmm. And he starts off about how he gets mistaken for the infamous Fred Neff. You know, he's walking down the street, Hey, Fred, you know, why don't you call a fellow sometime, you old son of a gun? And then he goes in about how everyone has a double out there, like the theory that, you know, there's only so many noses and chins and yeah. eyes to go around, which I think... That's kind of a good point. I mean, I've had, you know, people say, oh, I saw you at Sunset and Shuts a place. No, that that wasn't me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, there's someone who looks like me, huh? They used to happen at Whole Foods sometimes. Really? Yeah. Plus, it also didn't help that people would mistake me and Rick 
as each other. Oh yeah, that used to happen a lot. Especially when I when I take off the glasses, and he still does that. If I come to the university store, he'll go up to someone, Kevin, take off the glasses. I'm like, hey, so and so, look at us. And the other person will flip out, like, oh my god, you two look so much alike. I don't see it, but that's because <laughs> I know you. <laughs> yeah, but other people, other people see it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, in this case, it's like you know. It could be a problem if, you know, you look like Hitler and, you know, this takes place on the plane and someone sits down next to the guy and immediately says every wrong thing thing you could possibly think of. Mm -hmm. And I like just how it starts. Heil or or hi. Oh, man. I missed that one. Yeah. It's just it's just a laugh, right? It, It is hysterical. Next track. King Kong. Bob explains how he worked as an accountant and served in the Korean War. Remember that one? Spoiler alert, most Americans don't. Bob said... Unless you watch MASH. Yes. And that TV series lasted longer than the war. Yep. He said in his accounting experience, there was always an orientation, but the first day always presented a problem they didn't cover in training, which everyone can relate to no matter what their job is. So Bob creates a scenario where a new security guard who's gone through orientation faces King Kong climbing the Empire State Building on his first day at work. And there's really not much the guard can do since his jurisdiction really only extends to Kong's navel. Things are also complicated when the guard sees Kong carrying a woman who definitely is not an employee. After some back and forth, Bob pitches his idea, smear the Chrysler building with bananas. And how does the boss react to that? We'll never know. As far as sketches about King Kongo, I think this is pretty good. The only other one I've seen was on Dean Martin's show where the gorilla decided to take the elevator, which wasn't too bad. And Dean Martin was the bellhop boy. A sketch that makes you grateful for working a regular 9-to-5 job where acts of God are few and far in between. Mm. Now this and the next three tracks are from nine, from 1965's clunkily titled The Button-Down Mind of Bob Newhart, The Windmills Are Weakening. And mm. uh, the album cover is a drawing of Bob as Don Quixote on a beat-up Rosinante, and the windmills are just, like, pretty beat up. Mm. I'm not sure what the what the connection is. Anyway, to me, this is a stone cold comedy classic. You said King Kong decides to climb the Empire State Building on the same night that it's a god's very first night on the job. Mm-hmm. Thanks a lot, Kong. So yes, as you said, it's not a problem that was covered in orientation or the manual. Mm. And as the guard tells his boss, I looked in the index under apes and apes toes. Yes, a- apes and apes toes. And he's between either 18 or 19 stories high, depending on whether there's a 13th floor or not. Yep. Which I find odd. I mean, I know there are buildings where, like, a superstition thing, like, you know, yeah. hotels or whatever. You know, you go from ru- floor 12 to floor 14, even though technically it still really is the 13th floor. Mm-hmm. Anyway... This is one of those skits where I don't want to give too much away because there are just so many hilarious lines and you really need to hear the whole thing for yourself. And it's 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 gold, Jerry. It's it's gold. It's comedy gold. It is just fall down funny. And this was another skit that came on when I was in the sign making office at Whole Foods, just laughing myself ridiculous mm-hmm. and just scaring people away. Mm. Next track, returning a gift. Bob talks about the question some men secretly ask themselves when they find a hair on their comb. Should I buy a toupee? Often he'll buy it. Most of the time the wife buys it. So Bob takes us to the complaint desk of a department store where a husband wants to return a toupee he got for Christmas. Apparently at a party, the husband bent down to put some cheese dip on a cracker, and guess where the toupee fell? Yeah, no one was eating cheese dip after that. After some back and forth, the department store employee informs the husband that the store needs a price tag in order to accept a return. The husband realizes where it is and makes a phone call to the party hosts. Probably my favorite sketch on the second disc so far, going to show how stupid things can get sometimes if we're a little vain and put too much value in our appearance. Yep, and I gotta say, even to this day, like sometimes I get out of the shower and I'm combing my hair and I think, oh, it looks like it's getting a little thin there, but maybe it's just because it's sweat. And then when it dries, it kind of comes up and I'm thinking, well... Maybe it's just covering something so far. Mm -hmm. So far, been lucky. Yeah. You know, not Uncle Michael yet. (laughs) Um, Got this from Nana's side of the family because they, I mean, especially, I don't know if you ever remember Uncle Frank, but I mean, even Mm -hmm. in like his late 80s, the guy had a full head 
of thick white hair. Well, it was like really impressive. Hmm. So I got that going for me, which, which is, is good, pretty, I guess. Which is pretty nice. Yeah. yeah. And like you said, returning a gift and that gift is definitely a toupee. Mm -hmm. And why would you return it? Because, like you said, there was this party scene and there was a bowl of cheese dip. And, well, I, uh, and this is absolutely hilarious. And again, you, you just need to hear the whole thing. I yep. mean, Bob is just so great as just like the, guy who's just caught up in a situation that he has no idea what to do and you know he his stammer just runs wild mm -hmm. where he's just trying to keep it under control like how do i resolve this and keep it cool and why aren't you helping me resolve this yep he's still better than most people i've run into in customer service though because <laughs> i'd be like guy are, are you okay then he tells me what's going on Oh, well, no wonder you're acting like this. Uh, okay, well, let's make this as expedient as possible. Because <laughs> that would happen at Whole Foods or, like, even sometimes working in my current job is, like, when something embarrassing happens to somebody or it's, like, the awkward scenario of, like, I have so-and-so as your emergency contact. That's my ex-husband. Okay, he's gone. <laughs> I just try to accommodate people when they've been through some really embarrassing stuff. Mm -hmm. Kind of like this. Anyway, next track. Buying a house. Bob is in the process of buying a house and shares his opinion on realtors. You know, people who didn't make it as used car salesmen. The sleaze of this character comes across right away. The first warning bell is when he calls the place rustic, which is what they say on the Great British Baking Show when a cake looks like utter crap. <laughs> Eventually, the couple sees right through this guy and leaves. In my opinion, if you want a better version of this sketch... Go listen to the Portuguese Fireman's album, Faj Bobai, where they do a Portuguese realtor sketch. Oh, yes. And he markets the house to a non-Portuguese couple. It's hysterical. That man could sell anything. Oh, that is hilarious. Yep. Yep. You forgot about that sketch, didn't you? I did. Mm -hmm. I did. And this, is, this to me, is another skit where at, at the time it came out, this type of material may have been new. May have been new. May have been new. Excuse me. <laughs> But over the decades, it's been done to death. But it's still funny, though. I mean, there's some great lines like about realtors of people who didn't make it as used car salesmen, which I'm sure the used car salesmen must have loved. And the realtors must have hated. And they must have, like, you know, posted Bob's picture in every used car lot around the country. Yeah, this guy comes in. Yeah, you take care of him. Give him whatever he wants. My, uh, there's a couple of lines that I like. Like, it's got seven bedrooms and one bath. Mm -hmm. That's That's just great. And... And the ocean view. You want to come over by the cliff? Now crouch down. Which reminds me of your mom saying how the house in Fall River. Yeah. They were told there's a view of the bay. Uh-huh. Of course, you have to stand on the roof of the house to, to see, see it, it. And maybe stand on your tiptoes once you're even on the roof. Yep. To see the bay. Yep. But it is there. Yeah. In order to see the bay on Center Street, you have to basically be at the top of the hill before you plunge all the way to the bottom where Bachi and Jaju's house is. Because after that, you're not seeing the bay. No way bay. Nope. Yep. Yep. Um, did you notice something about the end of the uh, the end of this routine? No. What happened? Did you listen to it on headphones? No. I listened to it on, on the speakers. Okay. Because what happened is... Something did happen during the recording of this bit. What? It's live until the last 20 seconds. Oh, something, did something and happen? And then it's in the studio. Because you notice there's no laughter at, at all. End. Oh. And I think maybe what happened when they were recording it was, oh, crap, we lost the end of this when we were recording That's live. It, yeah. Did we run out of tape? Or there must have been some sort of recording snafu yeah. and they had to have bob just reproduce the last 20 seconds in the studio that's not too bad as opposed to having to redo the whole sketch yeah that's true but it's still a bit jarring though because it's it's really obvious but you know rhino had to work with what they had the tapes that they had and mm -hmm. you know they did the best that they could next track. and Oops, sorry. it's sorry it's like i said it's it's a little jarring it's the only thing that kind of throws off the skit i didn't notice Next track, Ben Franklin in Analysis. Bob informs us of a book that does psychological studies of famous Americans, trying to explain why people acted and reacted the way they did. I think you read something similar when you were telling me about that book where that woman analyzed all these famous marriages. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. 
when she talked about John and Yoko and a couple other people. Uh, yeah, it was about the uh, uh, about their muses. It was uh, oh okay, oh was. Nietzsche, John and Yoko, um, Samuel Johnson. There was some others I can't remember, but yeah, it was just really fascinating. Bob is of the opinion that they should have done Ben Franklin, so we get to meet Ben Franklin's analyst, which for those of you who don't speak 1960s and 70s means therapist. Because the only way I learned about that was in Stephen Sondheim's company, where he says, can I call, uh, what was it? I telephoned my analyst on Monday. Uh, I telephoned my analyst about it, but he said to see him Monday. But by Monday, I'll be floating in the Hudson with the other garbage. Mm. That's a line in a show. And then when they did the reboot of it for the 21st century, they had to change analyst to therapist. Anyway, I think this sketch is the one that comes, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> All I can think of is Tobias Fumke. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. Analyst, therapist, and you don't mush those words together because you put it on a business card and someone's going to call the cops. <laughs> I forgot about that. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Yeah. Anyway, I think this sketch is the one that comes the closest to foreshadowing Bob's role on television years later. Mm. Uh, to say the analyst is fed up is an understatement, especially when Ben is three months behind in his payments. We delve more into Franklin's experiments as opposed to, you know, the whoring and the drinking, because that's not Bob's humor, and I don't think he could have gotten away with it back then, even if it was. Um, oh, that's a good question. Because he, he's not the type of comedian to cover those topics anyway. Not, no, he's not he's really not. But I think he would have. I think he would have toned it down. And I'm not sure. Like this was because he did Grant 1965. Yeah, and I'm not sure if. Lenny Bruce was still going through the stuff he was going through. He may have been. Maybe. That would add up because I saw that movie, All That Jazz, recently where they talk about the Bob Fosse, Lenny Bruce movie with Dustin Hoffman. Oh, okay. So that would have been around the time. Anyway, the most hilarious part is when Franklin says the lightning fused his glasses to his eyeballs. So they're going to try shock treatment where they stick him inside the Liberty Bell and swing it a couple of times. And all I could think of was Spider-Man 3. When they're in the bell tower and they're yeah. ringing the bell With and the venom. suit comes off. Well, and he's, he's cured. He's cured. Well, that's how it's always been done. They did that in Spectacular Spider-Man as well. Because isn't that what happened in the comics to get him off? Yeah. Now, hear me out. I think a great crossover would have been this guy, Ben Franklin's analyst, with Stan Freeberg's America. Yes. I'd pay to see that easily, especially with how Franklin is portrayed in that show with uh, that little kid. Which we get to Stan Freeberg... We'll, we'll go into that more in depth because I don't want to spoil that just yet. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like you said, this is based on the book called Psychological Studies of Famous Americans. Mm-hmm. And it tries to explain in terms of psychology why these people did what they did, which I guess makes sense at the time because psychology was like the new thing and we're going to apply it to every single thing we possibly can. Yeah. Um, and as Bob says, one person they didn't include was Bang Franklin, hence the skit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Who is it, Mary? Ben Franklin, can I duck him, Mary? And Ben is three months behind on his account. He's 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 thrifty, all right. Yep. <laughs> and I, I like how Ben talks about a recurring dream about how he's walking down the street and he finds a half dollar with his face on it. And you say Washington has the same dream, but he sees his face on paper. You want to give Washington my number? And I like about the ribbon incident with Betsy Ross because he needs ribbon for the uh, tail of his kite. Yeah. And he just isn't going to pay Betsy at all for the cloth. Nope. And Ben just ends up speaking in um, in his adages. Penny yeah. saved as a penny earned mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And, and like you said, he also invents contact lenses when he gets hit by lightning and it fuses the glasses to his eyes. So he also <laughs> invents bifocal contacts, which I guess are a thing now. Probably, somehow, yeah. And you don't have to put them in a certain way. You just pop them in and... There you go, mm-hmm. which is something I I cannot do contacts. It's like, no, like I just see that scene in all that jazz where Roy Schneider is putting drops in his eye and Bob Fosse does the extreme close-up. I can barely look at that. I can't imagine putting in contact lenses in my eyes. Uh, uh, <sighs> and like you said, shock, shock treatment's recommended of putting Ben inside the Liberty Bell. You ring it a couple of times. And the effects wear off in, you know, what was it, two to three years? You'll, you'll be yeah. okay. Or you'll end up like Paul and uh, John, Paul, George, and Ben. Or his head's ringing when he still goes to work and can't hear anything. <laughs> and once again, Ben skips out on paying his bill. Better luck next time, Bob. Which I could probably see him doing in, in real life. Oh, 100%. Uh, 
but back then, hey, come on, I'm Ben Franklin. Come on, you, you're lucky. You're lucky to have me as as your client. Come yeah. on, as yeah. your patient. Come on, go on, on bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Which you would probably say. Yeah. Next track, Daddy of All Hangovers. Bob says the most frightening part of marriage is being married to someone who knows you, all of you, including the darker parts. Meaning you can't. You, you can't bullshit them. Yep, you can't fool them at all, as he says. So he does a sketch where a man has what he calls the daddy of all hangovers. This one I can tell would be better if seen in person because Bob is really using his body to exaggerate how he's feeling with his hangover, as evidenced by the audience's laughter during moments of silence. And the fact that his wife notices right away isn't really a major achievement, considering how bad he is at tricking his kids, saying, I have a cold. Yeah, the kind you can get from alcohol. Nice going, Bob. Just goes to show even when you think you're doing a good job of keeping it together... Oh, you're really not. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, the last three skits, this one and the next two, are from 1967's Summer of Love psychedelic classic, Sergeant Newhart's Lonely Hearts. I mean, uh, (laughs) this is it. And this really was it. This was Bob's last comedy album of original material. Wow. But he would come back in 1997 with The Button Down Concert in association with Nick at Night. And this oh. this was a 1995 concert that was basically a greatest hits performance. So it was just all um, previously re- released material. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess at at that time they had uh, the Bob Newhart show on Nick at Night. It was really popular, and hey, mm-hmm. let's go on tour. And with him being on tour in 1995, I'm pretty sure then that that was the year your mom and I saw him on Tax Day at PPAC. Mm-hmm. So we're back to the everyday once again. Daddy has a cold. Uh, another cold, yes. Now, who told you you can get a cold from booze? Oh, mommy. And this skit is actually a lot funnier than I remember because oh. I thought, you know, okay, it's a daddy of all hangovers. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, familiar stuff. But it is so hilarious, just his delivery and like you said you wish you could see it because you know he's doing more than just he's bobbing and weaving yeah he's yeah. bob so he's very good at bobbing <laughs> next track on trains and planes no automobiles bob talks Ooh. about how he was recently a guest on the tonight show with johnny carson in New- nyc yeah back when it was new york before they flew out to uh california to los angeles yeah now july in new york city isn't a festival as he says someone was even mauled by a lion in central park no, actually, it was the lion who was mauled. Oh, really? Oh, God. Yeah, they said the lion escaped, it got mauled, and then it knocked on the door to be let back in. So, oh, you don't want to go back out there. It's New York is a concrete jungle, after all. Yep. But when he Bob travels, he takes the train, because when he flies, he does white-knuckle flights. So he talks about the treatment he gets when he's on a train, and they really don't want you there. By this point, we've heard Bob do a lot of sketches about his fear of flying, and we don't really need any more since the message is clear at this point. So again, just stick to the Grace L. Ferguson airline. Mm-hmm. And this is an okay bit. Like you said, Bob talks about traveling by trains as he hates flying. And it's interesting because he talks about, you know, the kind of cars that they have and they keep the John at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know if they do that sort of thing now, but I kind of had a little trouble trying to picture it, but I guess it was a common thing back then. And he does bring up a line, like you said, about how, like, like, the trains just always hated having people on because they could use them for, you know, hauling stuff, mm-hmm. which they still do these days because I mm-hmm. know if you know, like about a week or two ago, there was that massive railroad strike that was averted. Yes, I know. And it would have crippled the whole country. Yep. They said it would have cost like $2 billion, billion a day. So yeah. railroads are very, very necessary to this country, uh, this country's economy. Railroads so, and trucks. Yeah. So keep them all happy. Okay. Just, just, just. Keep them all happy. Well, apparently they didn't with the first version of the deal that they uh, struck with them because the reason that they were striking was because they weren't getting any paid sick time at all. Oh, man. Yeah, and they reached the deal and the railroad workers immediately went on Twitter and were like, yeah, I don't believe what the papers are saying. This deal is absolute shit. Oh, man. So I don't know how it got resolved eventually because I think uh, they're trying to keep it hush-hush. And people were saying for Biden, you know, it was the first strike that he was dealing with. So workers of the world were going to be paying attention. Oh, I bet. Anyway. So anyway, Bob spends more time talking about flying than riding on the train. Mm-hmm. And he talks about getting bombed at the airport bar before he gets on the plane. And it turns out that his drinking buddy at the bar is the captain. Because mm-hmm. he's like, I hate flying too. 
And he also tries to figure out which passenger would have a bomb on the plane. Oh, God. They're not in first class because, you know, why pay the extra money if you know you're not going to finish the flight? It's definitely not the one who's looking around over his shoulder saying, so who's the air marshal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Funny skit, though. Yeah. Final sketch. Probably one of my favorites on here. Really? Modern witch doctor. Bob read an item in the paper where they got 200000 to study witchcraft because witchcraft healing had some medicinal value, and it still does. So Bob decides to do a bit about a witch doctor in the modern day trying to practice his type of medicine in the contemporary world. This is up there with the toupee sketch is one of my favorites on the CD, as Bob gives the witch doctor contemporary foibles such as the house call and wanting to have enough time for golf on Wednesdays while this kid is seeing demons and spinning his head around like the exorcist. Also perfect when fall is upon us and Halloween is about to start. Okay. So good timing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was interesting about, you know, someone spent $200,000 invested in a study for witchcraft. Yeah. And Bob wanted, could the reverse be true? And apparently it could. Yep. Um, some of the lines I like are, the crops are withering and your son is seeing demons. Yeah, there's a lot of that going around. Yep, <laughs> yep. And I love, I don't make hut calls anymore. I haven't danced around a house in years. You know, you, you you stop doing it, you lose the knack. But there's this other guy who's still doing house calls and dancing around houses, which says a lot about him. Yeah. <laughs> well, for me, this skit is nothing la nothing really laugh out loud, but you get some chuckles. And it's an okay skit, and I wish that this collection ended on more of a high note, but I really can't complain about it. No matter which like doctor's said, fun. <clears throat> this probably was also maybe another one that could have led to the Bob Newhart show. Mm-hmm. Mm. Overall, the second CD was okay. I was used to Bob's delivery and setup at this point, so nothing, you know, really wowed me. There are a few tracks that are worth listening to, but I think if you only listen to the first CD, you wouldn't be missing out on much by not listening to the second, because it gets pretty formulaic after a while and you kind of know what to expect. So do give Bob's shows, TV shows a try, though. You'll have fun sitting and binging some episodes. Hmm, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, comedy is subjective, and what I yes. find funny, you may not. Or what was once funny isn't, or even vice versa. Yeah. I mean, I'm a fan of Bob's humor. It's dry, and he makes me think while I laugh. Mm -hmm. And as for this collection... Again, it's two CDs, mm -hmm. it's 24 tracks, mm -hmm. it's a lot of material if you're not a Bob fan. And why aren't you a Bob fan? What's the matter with you? <laughs> anyway, half the tracks on this collection are just comedy classics. Mm -hmm. Could they have made it one CD? They probably could have. They probably could have, yeah. but, you know, I'm, I'm glad I have all the stuff here. I mean, even the, um, the, the tracks that aren't laugh out loud, I kind of find things that I didn't notice before, like, mm. you know... Like, this time around, since we had to review I really paid attention to those tracks where I thought, oh, this isn't going to be as funny as, you know, I think it is. And spoiler alert, it was. it was. Yeah, it turned out to be funnier. Like, oh, I missed that line before, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you want to check out Bob's uh, stuff, you know, I'm sure it's on Spotify and on YouTube. Definitely on YouTube. Um, and, yeah, definitely check out uh, his shows, especially... The Bob Newhart Show from 72 to 78 and Newhart, which ran from 82 to, I want to say it was 1990. And also influenced Breaking Bad. Really? With the alternate ending that I told you about they put in the DVD oh, extras. Yes. Yeah. Which, I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's hilarious, but if you Google it, you can find the scene and you can find the behind the scenes with Brian Cranston mm -hmm. explaining how they came up with this idea. And in a couple of months, you know, those of you who are into Christmas, you know, you'll see him again as Papa Elf on Elf. Not a bad legacy to leave behind. No, not at all. All right, as always, thank you for listening to Leia's Insomnia, my dad listens to this. Remember, like, comment, and subscribe, and all that jazz, because the more you interact with the video, the more views we have a higher chance of getting on YouTube. Yay! And we appreciate that. Yes, we do. Follow me on social media if you want, because I post the episodes there. And uh, if you like our episodes, drop a donation on Ko-Fi to say thank you. And if you are friends with my dad and you want a specific episode, email him. Let him know what you want to hear, and he'll send the episode right to your inbox. As always, we are My Dad Listens to This. We will be back next time with another album today, Pick and Gripe About. Oh, yeah, Dad, anything you want to say before we sign off? Bye, Bob. Bye, Bob. <laughs>